This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why do gay men like iced coffee? There are two components of an iced coffee that satisfy the biological traits of the gay man. First, the temperature. The cooler drink is preferred because gay bodies naturally run warmer. Gay men average 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than their straight counterparts. This is due to carrying the emotional stress of all their friends' real-life drama, knowing the details of their workplace drama, as well as the fictional drama of at least a dozen reality shows. The lower temperature also allows gay men to consume the coffee faster, which leads to our second point, caffeine. Caffeine has some significant effects specific to the gay male. It allows gay men to walk faster. Because gay men are, on average, late to things, walking faster allows them to be 10 minutes late instead of 15. It also provides a rush of endorphins that only gay people can achieve by passing slower straight people. While caffeine may give others palpitations, gay people actually wake up with palpitations every morning by simply knowing it's a new day, and caffeine is needed to reach homeostasis. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, are verse bottoms going extinct? We're going to look at the decreasing bioavailability of the verse bottom. Gay men often use self-identified sex positions to find their ideal partner. In the spectrum, you have tops, bottoms, versatile, and you have subsets in between them, verse tops and verse bottoms. Let's take a look at two factors that account for the endangered group. Actual extinction. Verse bottoms are a vulnerable subtype because though sometimes they like to top, they are naturally submissive. This leaves them exposed to pressures like religion and conversion therapy. Many verse bottoms can sustain a closeted relationship with a woman because there's just enough top in them to make it through another day. Also, many well-known Republicans are verse bottoms and we simply can't claim them. Perceived extinction. The remaining bioavailable verse bottoms then endure a type of bottom shaming that leaves them less desired. To many, topping a top sounds hot. Bottoming for a bottom sounds disgusting. It's a double standard. So verse bottoms have shifted to self-identifying as bottom or verse. So with so few verse bottoms left, most scientists agree that the subtype will die out by 2025, leading the way to further divide the gay order into increasingly strict roles, leading us to the eventual reality of a gay matrix. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why do gay men color their hair in a crisis? Your gay friend just dyed his hair in a time of stress. It may be the loss of a job, a breakup, or after a promising first episode, American Horror Story's plot went completely off the rails once again. What a waste of great talent. There are two biological reasons for this response. The first, protective resemblance. It's used in nature to blend in and avoid predators. Many gay men are highly experienced with this response, hiding their homosexuality with boat shoes and a feigned love for tailgating. After coming out, gay men operate in the opposite direction and bleach their hair. This new appearance allows gay men to feel like a different version of themselves. It's how they run away from their problems by leaving them unresolved in their old body. The second reason, signaling. In nature, it's used as a warning. Gay men use bright colored hair to tell friends and acquaintances, I'm not well right now. If there's a public meltdown over the shakshuka at brunch, the hair color will work as a signal to others that a gay man is having a hard time. If you see a friend bleach or color their hair, check in on him. See if he's posted any erratic stories, made any recent changes to LinkedIn, or created a new dating profile. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why can't gay men sit in a chair properly? Have you ever noticed how a gay man refuses to sit in a chair the way it was intended? There are two reasons for this. The first, biological deviation. Gay people are born into a world that's not meant for them. It's a world created by and for straight people. From the stories we're told, to the things we see all the time, to other gay inconveniences. The natural gay approach is to use things differently. This includes how to wipe and how to talk to women. This also extends to sitting in a chair. The second, functional diversity. While the straight brain runs on a binary system of yes or no, the homosexual brain sees many functions and solutions. It's why gay men don't see the visible light spectrum as white, but instead as many different color choices. It's why they customize their apartments even though it's just a rental. It's why they can always get into a party, regardless of the circumstance. And why they can find countless ways to sit in a chair. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why can't gay men remember each other's names? Most gay men have been there, frustrated at a fellow homosexual for not remembering their name. However, they can't even remember his. We'll look at three reasons for this. Encoding. A homosexual male may not be able to remember a name because there's a lot of competition between other names and faces in their memory, who all have the same haircut. Is this James, Eric, or Matt? But you also know nine Matts already, and two of those Matts are twins. Or are they dating? Hyperfocus. Gay men are often too focused on the impression they're making that they block out new information. This includes the stress of appearing confident but approachable, getting your own name right, and wondering if you've met them before and if you should have said nice to see you again instead of nice to meet you, but now you've missed their name entirely and you've been talking for two minutes and it's too late to go back. Distraction. Gay men are easily distracted, especially when surrounded by other homosexuals. Mid-conversation, you might see a hot guy walk in who looks familiar. You'll think, have I met him? I wish I could remember his name. You actually did meet him last week when you wondered the same thing about another hot guy who just walked in, who you also met the week prior. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why are gay boys always the female teacher's favorites? Ask any female teacher who she loved the most in class, and they will always answer the gay boys. Young gay brains are different. Here's why. Emotional intelligence. While most kids are ready to bolt from a class right when it ends, gay kids hang around and get it on the teacher's level. How are you? Did you watch The Bachelor? What's the hot gossip in the teacher's lounge? 
Who's cheating on their wife? Responsible. When a straight boy takes home the class pet, the rabbit comes back with missing fur and a broken leg. When a gay boy takes it home, it returns to class with an accessible ramp matching decor, filtered water from the Brita, and a designer salt lick. Hormones. As the straight students get distracted by flirting with their crushes, gay boys don't have that option and pay attention to their teachers more. Teachers often feel more valued and appreciated by the gay students in class than they do their own husbands. Creativity. While the rest of the class drew a shitty turkey on the outline of their hand, the gay kid made an entire scene on a turkey farm, where that turkey was the one pardoned by the president. And the hands of that turkey are also mini turkeys, who have also been pardoned by mini presidents. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, we'll explain the phenomenon of Disney gays. You may have encountered a gay adult male who is completely obsessed with Disney. Their apartments, birthdays, and hobbies are exclusively Disney. When you see one of these men post about their 1,000th visit to the park, you may ask yourself, isn't he too old for this? First, mind your business. Second, we'll explain. Escapism. For some gay people, the adult world is so terrible that they have to hold on to memories from childhood and permanently live in them. Harry Potter gays and Pokemon gays employ the same mentality but are seen as charming interests. They aren't met with the same judgment because they don't have the same broad entertainment opportunities as Disney gays, who have actually chosen the most robust coping mechanism. Environment. If you're a gay man living in Orlando, Tampa, or Daytona Beach, what else are you going to do? Corporate pledging. In the future, five corporations will own all human beings in the United States. Humans without corporate sponsors will not have the means to provide for themselves and will be thrown into the giant hole. Disney gays are placing their bets on Disney and showing their allegiance early and often to ensure they're chosen and provided for when the corporate adoption day comes on July 2nd, 2038. This is Gay Anthropology. In today's episode, Plant Gays. You may know a homosexual who is entirely invested in plants. We'll explain why. Gateway hobby. Gay men often find themselves involved in hobbies that take very little effort to start, but have the potential to go deep and become a full investment. This is why many gay men will buy a succulent at the sill on a whim and end up living in the house from Jumanji with 16 varieties of ficus. Fluctuating desires. Gay men want to feel necessary while managing the least amount of obligations. Plants make gay men feel like something's life depends on their existence, but they can still go to Palm Springs for the weekend. Gay men possess a contradicting blend of an intense desire to be included and severe indifference, to which plants seem to fit the mold perfectly for. Owning a lot of plants feels like starting a group chat and then muting everyone. It's still a group of friends, but with none of the noise. Conversation bridging. Because taste in music and entertainment vary greatly between straight and gay men, every gay person holds onto at least one gay straight topic while in the company of straights. Some of these topics include dogs, true crime documentaries, the gym, credit card points, the next supermoon, Trader Joe's, and of course, plants. This is gay anthropology. In today's episode, horror genre gays. It's an established fact that gay people are single-handedly keeping the horror entertainment industry afloat. We'll discuss three reasons why gays love the genre. Theatrics. Gay men thrive in drama. The combination of camp and death excites them. A landline phone ringing in a massive house in the suburbs gives them purpose. A group of teenagers stranded in an inbred small town makes them feel alive, especially when it includes the thrill of Jessica Biel running through the meat racks. Female power. Horror films often choose a strong female lead, which gay men are drawn to. A woman rising to power or surviving the unthinkable fuels a homosexual. It's powerful feminine energy, and gay men like to see themselves as that main character. Brave, resourceful, born with a special gift, and not being afraid to use it. Villains on the DL. For many gay men, there's something erotic about a concealed identity. They are most interested in someone they know absolutely nothing about, and then progressively lose interest the more they learn who they are. Toxic men with an unknown identity, terrible conversation skills, and practically no personality proves irresistible to a homosexual. This is Gay Anthropology. In today's episode, Game Night Lesbians. There's a special class of gay women who frequently host game nights or hope one breaks out. Here are three lesbian qualities that explain why. Competitive. While gay men and straight women feel vulnerable talking about their skills and talents, straight men and lesbians wear them like badges. Games provide a way for lesbians to see how their skills stack up against others in under 40 minutes. Active. A gay female always wants to do something, but like, not too much. Game nights hit the sweet spot within the lesbian activity window as something highly engaging that also doesn't require them to leave the house. Getting to know someone. A large social mixer with a bunch of strangers is a nightmare for a lesbian. When it comes to engaging in small talk, lesbians rank dead last. They'd rather get to know someone new in a living room with a game that shows them who they really are. Did you and your partner just get four cards with one word and code names? You must have a good relationship. Did you just make a baseless accusation out the gate in a murder mystery? You're erratic and wild and I find that attractive. And did you just use an adjective at the front of the word to steal points in categories? Honestly, I don't trust you and you need to get the f out of my house. This is Gay Science. In today's episode, why are gay coworkers either best friends or mortal enemies? All gay men have a dominant and submissive work trait that leads to different outcomes when placed together. 50% of the time, there will be a homo-heterozygous relationship where the traits balance to lead to a gay work bestie. Some signs of this dynamic include sharing all the juicy work gossip, discussing which straight coworkers might be gay, agreeing that all your coworkers are at least a little bit gay, and sharing 
contacts. The other 50% of the time, there will be a homo-homozygous relationship and gay adversaries. With two recessive traits, it will be passive-aggressive. Here are some classic behaviors. He's condescending because he thinks he's hotter than you. He's condescending because he thinks you think you're hotter than him and microwaving buttered popcorn all day because he knows you're on a low-carb diet. With two dominant traits, the work feud will be aggressive and intense. Expect things like never using your name, instead calling you the other gay guy, tapping his gay circles to dig up your worst rumors, then breaking gay code by telling your straight coworkers, taking load after load after load, and writing there can only be one on your desk in blood.